So I want to welcome everybody. Uh, as you're joining, uh, please make sure your microphone is muted. Um, looks like everybody's got that taken care of. Uh, I want to start out with just a couple of quick announcements from the NRRA. And uh, the first is that we have all of our uh, webinars related to the pavement workshop are now scheduled and available to um, get on your calendar. I have sent out most of these to everyone via an Outlook, Outlook calendar invitation. And I'm also including the link here in uh, the conversation box uh, to the web page that shows everything. Actually, that's the Research Pays Off page. I apologize. Here is the page with all of the workshop information. And um, you can go ahead and register for those. It's not a requirement, but it certainly helps us to plan for how many people we think might be attending. And um, so you can go ahead and check out that page. All of that is updated with links to um, each of the WebEx uh, connection information. And so you can register, and it will send you reminders. And um, it's a pretty good system, so we're going to be working with that. And um, I also just want to give a quick update about the call for innovation. Uh, the executive team was able to meet last week and kind of um, narrow down some of their choices. And so we will be um, just uh, doing a couple other things. And then um, we will be reaching out to the teams that sent in proposals and um, be giving them an update on where we're at with the process. So you can watch for information on that coming soon. And um, I believe that's everything I have for updates for the NRRA. Um, thank you for joining us today. We had a great turnout at our geotech webinar related to the pavement workshop. And so we're looking forward to um, all of the ones that we have scheduled through, um, I believe we have some scheduled through September. Um, so you, they're kind of spread out, which hopefully will help you uh, be able to get those in your, your calendars and to be able to participate. Today we are welcoming Ishan Dave and Katie Haslett from the University of New Hampshire and um, they're going to be discussing the project that they are kind of co-PIing um, for the flexible team here. And I will leave it up to you, Ishan and Katie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. And thank you to uh, MinDOT as well as NRRA for uh, letting us uh, present our work here. Uh, the presentation today, we will be doing a tag team approach. So I'll, I'll get us started, talk a little bit about the project and the test cells that have been constructed at Min Road facility. Uh, and then uh, Katie will, will take on uh, and, and go through some of the performance results that we have on these test sections in terms of reflective cracking and what we have learned so far in terms of different type of material choices as well as different type of overlay structures um, that that were uh, used in these test cells. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about uh, other efforts and other parts of this project. Uh, Katie will present some some results on some of the modeling effort that's underway, uh, and also uh, some of the upcoming tasks because it's really a multi-tasked uh, uh, study here. And I'll I'll talk a little bit about that that as well in in coming slides. So. Um, just to give you a very quick background, this was one of the first or early projects that uh, got started with the establishment of National Road Research Alliance. Uh, and it was uh, one of the long-term studies that the flexible team of NRRA came up with uh, in 2017. And on the basis of all the effort that, that went in from all the participants of NRRA, uh, 12 test sections were constructed that were focused on really looking at uh, coming up with, with different overlay choices in terms of not just materials but also structures in order to optimally rehabilitate uh, distressed concrete pavements 
and, and, and not just look at reflective cracking, but uh, as you might be aware, uh, recently there have been some, some uh, unique innovations in the field of how we put together our asphalt mixture, especially changes to our traditional approaches with respect to how we uh, try to achieve those volumetrics and even the volumetric thresholds that we have. Uh, and most of them revolve around looking at some alternative ways to uh, to get to densities or to even alter the, the the level of air voids and things of that nature. So this study, while focusing mainly on reflective cracking, it's also looking at what happens to your asphalt mixtures when they are put together with these alternative uh, volumetric designs and, and more specifically how their density then evolves in practice because that's usually a big question. We know how our traditional super pave type of mixes uh, densify under traffic, but uh, but there was limited data until recently on how, how some of these other mix, mixes, whether they are designed with a finer gradation or a regressed air void level or even concepts such as super pave five, uh, how would they densify in the traffic? So we also are looking at that as part of this, this same study. Uh, the, the project uh, itself, uh, I'm the principal investigator for it, and my colleague, uh, Professor Joe Sias, is co-principal investigator, and Katie Heslett is, is the graduate researcher who's been really the, the force behind this project. She's done a tremendous uh, amount of work with respect to field data, lab data, uh, as well as modeling effort, and that's why we, 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 we feel that it would be nice if she presented uh, her results and uh, all, the, all the work that she has done. So that's why we, we ended up going with this tech team approach for, for today's webinar. Um, the, the next slide here is just describing reflective cracking. I doubt that I need to spend too much time on it. Uh, it's really a distress mechanism by which uh, any of the underlying discontinuities in your pavement that has been rehabilitated with overlay uh, reflects into the overlay. And most commonly, uh, if you have an underlying rigid pavement that has poor load transfer efficiencies or excessive movement as, at joints, but same thing could also happen if you do overlays on flexible pavement where it, underlying cracks uh, in your existing asphalt pavement could reflect through that overlay. So that appearance of cracking is, is, is what we call reflection cracking or reflective cracking. Uh, and and it's, it's very important to consider both traffic and thermal loading when we are trying to evaluate reflective cracking because a lot of reflective cracking is actually caused due to movements that happen in underlying pavement due to thermal variations. And, and, and so we often see reflective cracking also on low volume roadways Although in this study, it's, it's focused pretty heavily on uh, mainline roadways uh, that were constructed on the old westbound uh, I-94 uh, uh, branch of, of main road. Um, a big challenge with reflective cracking is, is that it is the primary mechanism by which overlay lives are, are currently controlled. Um, unlike our other traditional pavements, oftentimes when you look at asphalt overlays, they, their life is usually controlled by reflective cracking. That's what controls how soon we have to do something else. And oftentimes that, that life is fairly short. Um, there's previous projects that we have been involved with, uh, working with various agencies, including MinDOT, um, where we looked at some of the thin overlays and the average number that we are looking at was, was usually three years to uh, as high as five years before uh, you had to do some kind of uh, rehabilitation on your rehabilitated pavements. Uh, especially if you if you ended up using thinner overlays, uh, which are typically defined in context of this study and, and those previous studies as as overlays that are usually three inches or, or thinner, so oftentimes two inches or two and a half inch thick. Uh, you are not getting a lot of life from those overlays because the the reflective cracking happens so so quickly. So it's it's a predominant mode of failure in your uh, uh, rehabilitated pavements, and that was the reason behind this, this project. Um, so the overall goal of the project is summarized on this slide. Uh, the final outcome of this project is to come up with a decision tree tool that can be used jointly by pavement designers and material specifiers uh, to come up with optimal combination of mixtures and, and, and overlay structures 
in order to, uh, to, to lower the rate of reflective cracking and prolong the life of that overlay. Uh, and as you can see in that goal, there's also the improving in situ density aspect. And that once again comes in uh, because we are trying out several different uh, ways to put together your asphalt mixtures in context of the constituent materials, whether it's uh, having a different amount of binder in the mixtures, different gradations or different uh, design air void levels. Uh, but the overall goal is, is, is to come up with this tool that agencies can take and, and go ahead and, and, and put in practice. So to that uh, effect, there are really uh, eight tasks that are put together uh, or that, that, that make this project. Uh, tasks, uh, uh, as you can see on the slide here, uh, it also shows where we stand with respect to project. The project started in 2018. Uh, we have about uh, uh, seven or eight more months left in the project uh, to wrap things up, but, but a fair bit of heavy lifting effort, at least in terms of the lab work and the field sections and so on, is already done. Um, now we are really focusing on developing the, the, the outcomes of the project. Um, so we started, as, as with most studies, with a very comprehensive literature review uh, and, and also uh, focus quite a bit on, on gathering information. Now keep in mind, as with most National Road Research Alliance projects, this is a team effort. Okay, University of New Hampshire is the primary contractor right now and, and we are tasked with coming up with, with, uh, with final outcome of the project, but there's no way I can take credit for everything that has gone into this project because a lot of this has been a team effort of whole NRRA, especially the member agencies. Um, for example, in task two, uh, we gathered laboratory performance test results um, on, on a very wide range of cracking tests that are out there and also some rutting and durability testing. Uh, and that was all done by, uh, by, by various uh, NRRA member agencies. For example, Wisconsin DOT conducted Hamburg test. Uh, Illinois DOT conducted the IFIT and the Texas overlay testing. And, and, and so all these various uh, members of NRRA have, have tremendously uh, participated in this project in providing us uh, with, with all sort of information. And, and I must say that, that uh, within, within those uh, entities that provided the information, I would like to specially acknowledge Minnesota Department of Transportation and specifically folks uh, that are within the main road section of, of, of that agency because uh, they have been really providing and uh, all the information that we are able to use in this project. They are the ones who, uh, who really uh, uh, oversaw the construction of these cells, uh, instrumented them. They are the ones who collect all the roughness information, the crack counts. Uh, and, and also uh, may not conduct an extensive amount of laboratory testing on these um, uh, test cells as well. Uh, and they conduct density measurements uh, 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 together with, with us. So uh, keep in mind, we, we are more or less a vehicle in this project. Uh, really the research activity and, and generation of data and everything else is truly a team effort and it really goes to show why we have so many uh, uh, agency and associate members now in NRRA. Uh, this project, in my opinion, is a good example uh, that demonstrates the, the, the overall uh, goal of NRRA that we really need to put our uh, efforts and our, our minds together in order to tackle and accomplish these challenging tasks that we have in the field of pavement engineering. Um, so task two really focused on collecting all that information from various agencies. Task three uh, was, was a modeling effort and, and Katie will talk a little bit more as to why uh, we, we needed to do mechanistic analysis of overlays uh, and, and not just rely on the test cells. Uh, task four focused on, on, on uh, looking at how the densities are changing for these sections, uh, especially by, by using some of the newer techniques that, that are being looked at and Yet another innovation that really came from MinDOT, uh, which is the density profiling system. Um, so we are applying that to this project and, and, and looking at how that compares against the, the field course as well. Uh, task five and six uh, is what, what we are really working on right now. Five is focused on depending on what you end up as your choices of materials and structures, 
how should the life and performance curve for your overlay should look like. And that's important because at the end of the day, when we are developing these uh, decision trees, uh, they are expected to be working within asset management systems that various agencies have. Uh, and in order to, to, to apply those asset management principles, we have to be able to provide uh, guidance on how cracking will develop onto these overlays and, 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 and also to some extent how their serviceability is going to change. Um, so that, that's something where we are taking everything that we know from the, the, the 12 test cells as well as supplementary data that we get from mechanistic analysis and, and, and package all of that together. Uh, there's also another side to it which looks at the condition of existing concrete and that's another reason why uh, some of the mechanistic analysis work has been undertaken because by using models we are able to simulate different type of load transfer efficiencies uh, whether we have voids under the, the, the joints or not and so on. Um, so uh, task five, six, seven really run in parallel. I mean, from, from contractive perspective, we say we are working on task five, but everything that happens in task five is really reflected into task six and seven because uh, that's really putting together the, the deliverables and, and tools that, that then uh, agencies can, can adopt. So next I'll, I'll talk a little bit about various sections. And once again, I, I cannot really take credit for these sections because uh, this was a team effort uh, of, of the flexible team of NRRA that uh, really uh, uh, had a lot of discussions through their monthly meetings. Uh, even at some point they were trying to do meetings every two weeks as the sections were, were really getting uh, finalized and designed. Uh, but Altogether, there are 13 different pavement test sections that, that we are looking at. Uh, it says 12 here because there are 12 that are, are, are constructed with various type of overlays, but we still have our original control section where no overlays were placed uh, and, and it's left as is. Um, so all of these test cells are located on the old westbound alignment of Interstate 94. Um, which is right now part of Min Road going into a uh, future if you have seen a recent presentation from Ben, Ro uh, ben Worrell uh, or, or Glenn Engstrom, you, you saw that now uh, the, the plan is going to change a little bit with respect to traffic control and so on. Um, so this, this old alignment may not, may not be available into future. Uh, but nonetheless, for this study, uh, it, it was optimal because it had a existing concrete pavement that had been minimally uh, repaired or rehabilitated resulting in a fairly poor load transfer efficiencies as you'll see uh, in one of the upcoming slides. Uh, and so it made for an optimal uh, location to look at overlay reflective cracking study. Um, so the, the existing pavement is nine and a half inch uh, concrete slab. Uh, there are 27 uh, uh, feet joint spacing. Uh, an original design had an inch and quarter dowel, so it was a jointed uh, uh, plain concrete pavement uh, on aggregate base with, with the, the clay subgrade. Uh, and so the, the control section 983 is left as is without the overlay, and there are 12 other sections that I'll discuss in two slides um, that have various type of uh, surface courses. Some of them also have a, a, a second course or a binder course. Uh, and the layers uh, using things such as uh, various type of highly modified fine graded asphalt mixes as well as uh, also looking at various type of construction technologies that, that look at varying rates of tech coat application um, as well as one section where we, we also have a, a, a polyurethane grout to stabilize the joints before the overlay construction. Um, so let's look uh, at the at various mixes that are evaluated in these test sections, uh, and this is where the, the the use of different type of asphalt mix designs also come into play. Um, so we can see that uh, altogether these twelve sections have uh, eight different type of asphalt mixtures. Uh, what I would call more or less your baseline asphalt uh, uh, mix design would be a uh, uh, the, the first one that you see here, and, and you can also see the min dot nomenclature, uh, and, and I don't expect everyone to be familiar with that, 
uh, but really is, is expression of your uh, nominal maximum aggregate size, uh, your target air void level, your traffic level for which this design uh, is, is used, and then that large character typically reflects to your PG binder grade. Um, so you can see all of those variations in this table, uh, but uh, a, a thing that I'd like to bring to your attention are, are these uh, mixes that you see, the second, third, and fourth mix in, in this table. Uh, they are more or less identical where this middle one uh, is, is really your baseline mix. Uh, they are all half-inch nominal maximum size mixes. They all have same PG binder. Uh, this, this, this third mix is essentially your standard super pair mix. So it's a super pair mix that's uh, designed according to uh, the, the min dot uh, current requirements, which does not use VMA, but uses adjusted asphalt film thickness. Uh, but nonetheless, th this mix also meets your standard super pair VMA requirements. Um, and then off of that, there are two additional mixes that you can see. The 430E is the regressed air void mix design, where by addition of a little bit more binder and also a little bit uh, change in the gradation, uh, 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 they, they were able to come up with a 3% uh, air void design mix. Uh, and then you can see uh, the 450E, uh, which would be very similar to super pair 5 type of approach, uh, where it's really designed to have a 5% air void level. Uh, but keep in mind, it's a little bit more different than that. It also had a, a, a slightly lower wrap amount, a lower gyration level. And, and, and finally, uh, I'd also mention that while it's designed as at 5%, it was not really targeted to be constructed at 5%. Uh, and that's where it varies from your uh, current super pale 5 approach that uh, Indiana and other states are looking at, uh, uh, where, where, where super pale 5, you would design at 5%, but you would then also construct it to have a target air void level of 5%, which was not the case uh, in this, this particular study here. Uh, we have 119 millimeter mix, which was really used as a, as a first course. Uh, on overlays which were uh, thicker, thicker here being four inches as you'll see on next slide. Uh, we also have an interlayer mixture uh, which was really designed with a very highly modified binder uh, with a E58E-34 E minus binder, a low air void level, um, and then have, have another 475 mix uh, which is uh, not so highly modified and designed a little bit more like uh, a 475 super pale type of approach uh, with 4% air void level as a result also has a little bit less uh, less binder content in there. Um, lastly, there's one section that uses ultra thin bonded wear course. So this is a technology with a single pass application with a tech coat, uh, 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 usually a polymer modified tech coat at a high uh, short rate that's placed right before the 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 bonded wear course is applied and, and again in this case uh, it, it used uh, 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 what I would call a more premium binder in the mix as compared to other uh, ones which had a 58 um, heavy minus 28 versus uh, 58V very heavy minus 34 grade uh, with the UT uh, BWC or ultra thin bonded wear course. Um, so going through these 12 cells, and bear with me, it's a little bit animated here just to uh, make some comparisons and contrast and so on. Um, so we'll start with cell 987, and this is what I consider as, as sort of uh, a, a control overlay section, where this would be a section that a that, uh, lot of agencies would, would consider to be used on this particular pavement given the condition of the joints and the condition of the existing pavement. So it has four inches of total overlay. It's uh, two different mixes. Uh, first two and a half is your uh, three quarter inch or 19 millimeter uh, 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 lift. And, the, and, and then you have a wear course or a surface course on top, which is a inch and a half, nine and a half millimeter standard super pale mix uh, with a 58H minus 28 binder uh, and 20% wrap. So uh, that would be something that that, that would uh, uh, rather 25% wrap. So that would be a standard min dot uh, wearing course mix that, that one would consider. Um, so we would think of that as a sort of control section for overlays. 
then we have these four test cells which are all part of that density valuation where we still have four inches of total overlay thickness and since they are all half inch nominal maximum aggregate sizes instead of doing an inch and half wear coat they are slightly thicker um, to make sure that we don't have any issues with compaction and things like that so they are inch and three quarter uh, wear courses the main difference between these four sections is that the wear course is slightly different in each one. 988 is again your 4% airward design, your standard super pave type of mixture. 989 is designed at 5% airward, so some, somewhat like super pave 5. 990 is a regressed airward section, so it has a percent lower airward and a little bit more binder as a result. Uh, and 991 is what is commonly referred to as the number eight gradation in, in uh, your Ashto M23, uh, sorry, 323. So that's a finer gradation uh, that people have often seen to, to provide better cracking resistance. And that's the reason why that 991 was considered. Um, so we'll keep an eye on these four because the, the, the nice thing about actually all five of them is they all have same total structure and especially these four have, have identical structure where they have two and a, a quarter inch 19 millimeter as a first lift and then inch and three quarter on top with everything else same um, except for for these different ways of putting together that we are course mixture. 992 and 993 is what I call interlayer sections and I call them as interlayer sections because both of them have a sort of interlayer uh, that is used right on top of concrete before putting an inch and a half wear course. Um, so they have a nine and a half millimeter uh, wear course with, with same mixture or control mixture that, that was placed on 987 as a wear course. Uh, but both of them have one inch of interlayer. Uh, in case of 992, this is a highly polymer modified asphalt interlayer with, uh, as you <laughs> see the slide, a 4.75 millimeter mixture. Uh, designed using a 58E minus 34 binder. Um, 993 actually has a PSAB, uh, which is a permeable uh, uh, asphalt based material that is uh, oftentimes used uh, as, as asphalt based material for unbonded concrete overlays or even uh, for new construction for concrete overlays. Uh, so it's really a, a sort of open graded material with fairly high film thicknesses. Uh, and, and that's what was considered in case of 993. So slightly different approaches to doing the interlayer design uh, between. I apologize, Ishan, we have lost your audio. I'm trying to get you back. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, I believe someone muted me. Maybe they tried to mute everyone and I, I was Yeah, muted. I was trying to mute all of the audience because I was hearing something Understood. else in the background and I yeah. it muted you for some reason. Oh, no, no problem. I muted myself now. So. <laughs> yeah. And uh, let and me know when the screen share is connected and I'll, I'll continue on. Also, uh, do you happen to know at what point we lost the audio? Um, I, I think just for a few seconds, but I, I was pretty quick to jump in. Okay. So, Wonderful. Yes, we, we see your screen now. Thank you. No problem. So so just before when we lost audio, I was talking about the interlayer sections and how uh, they both have uh, the first lift is really material, which is uh, supposed to provide you with good strain tolerances with different type of approaches. One using a very fine grained or fine graded mixture, a 4.75 millimeter mixture with High poly, highly polymer modified binder. The other one uh, approach, which is using a more of a permeable type of asphalt based material, 
which would also have a fairly high strain tolerance just because of the openness of the material and, and relatively uh, thicker uh, asphalt films uh, that, that would give you that, that added strain tolerance. Uh, the next four sections here, the main difference between them is really looking at uh, uh, the slight difference in the mix as well, but mainly looking at the construction technique, uh, whether we go with a more conventional paving approach versus use of a spray paver approach and also the rate at which that coat is applied. Um, so if you compare 984 versus 994, uh, they, they, they are almost similar. The only difference in 994 though is that the existing concrete pavement was also stabilized prior to construction of overlay by grouting of polyurethane underneath the joints in order to fill up the voids underneath the joints. So 84 and 94 are identical. The only difference is, is what happens when you try to use a, a grouting procedure to, uh, to help stabilize your, your joints and slabs uh, prior to construction of overlay. Uh, if we compare 84 to 85 and 86, uh, there's slight difference in the mix because this one had a, a, a three-eighth inch mix versus half inch mix. Uh, but the main difference is, is that uh, we are using our more conventional tech coat application rate that's typically used in asphalt construction of 0.08 to a tenth of gallon per square yard versus a low rate of tech coat application and, and, and try to attempt a, a, a higher rate but using a spray paver as opposed to using conventional paver which many agencies have now adopted a standard practice whereby the tech coat is applied simultaneously with the application of overlay and it, it's expected to provide better adhesion uh, and also some advantages in terms of the cracking performances as previous studies have shown. Um, and then lastly, we have section 995, uh, which is has the thinnest of all the overlays uh, of, of all 12 sections here, uh, which is a single pass ultra thin bonded wear course application. Uh, and, and, and this is not typically something that has been traditionally used as a reflective cracking type of application, uh, but in this case has, has been adopted uh, uh, to really study what would happen if we use this kind of system which, which is expect, expected to have a good uh, tolerance to strain because of that very thick polymer modified membrane of tech coat uh, that we place when we apply ultra thin bonded wear coats. There, there have also been some studies in past that have looked at uh, using this type of uh, layer as an interlayer. That was not the case in, in, in this study, uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, I would want you to keep an eye on this section as we go through results, because again, keep in mind, this one has very small amount of uh, asphalt available on it, only three quarter inches. Uh, and, and you'll see that 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 still uh, outperforms some of the other sections which have twice as much asphalt on them. Now trafficking on these uh, uh, systems, uh, since they are on Interstate 94, but they are on the on 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 the old alignment, so they really act as bypass, and uh, that's really once again a, a great feature of main road facility whereby. Uh, traffic can be placed on these sections uh, and you can really have twice as many sections by having this bypass type of arrangement. Um, so typically every month, uh, uh, MinDOT or, or rather people at MinRoad would set up uh, a traffic control whereby these sections will get trafficked while and, and it will also give chance to uh, uh, researchers at MinRoad uh, to, to go in, uh, ahead and do their data collection and, 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 and other distress identification work on, on the other mainline sections, which are part of other studies. Um, so here you can see the total trafficking that has happened uh, between 17, 18, and 19. Keep in mind these sections were constructed in September of 17, so that's why the trafficking wasn't as, as high uh, as, as 18 and 19, but they have seen a fair bit of traffic if we look at and, and yes, the data is provided in terms of drive, driving and passing lanes. Um, and, and we did uh, uh, divide out the, the car total versus truck total. We do have, because MinRoad collects all this data, we do have the, the exact classes and stuff like that. But just for simplicity of play, uh, putting data here, 
uh, truck total shows everything that would uh, classify as truck category according to main dots, main dots vehicle classification system. Um, and you can see the driving lane had, had already seen about 750,000 trucks, and that was by 2019, I'm sure, in these, uh, at least in first three months of this year, it had seen a lot more. Um, since COVID-19, maybe traffic has not been as, as severe. But nonetheless, uh, overall, uh, these sections have seen, uh, depending on driving versus passing lanes, uh, between 3.3 to, uh, to about 4 million vehicle passes, so uh, a fair bit of, of traffic. Um, so what I would like to do at this point in time, since we have a good transition, is I'll actually hand the presentation over to Katie. We'll continue to run it off of my computer just for logistical reasons, uh, but Katie is going to go through and, and talk about how these sections are performing and what we have learned so far. Uh, from these sections, and uh, you can actually see her in these pictures because uh, uh, we, we won't be able to do it this year because of coronavirus, but uh, previous years uh, we have been sending her out to Min Road and having her work with uh, folks at MinDOT uh, in order to gather the density data and help with the distress surveys as well as uh, coding of specimen and, and, and so on. So, Katie, uh, uh, take it over and let me know uh, whenever you want me to advance the slides and so on. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dawe, for uh, getting us uh, kicked off there today. Um, so in the next several slides, I'll really be presenting just a glimpse of some of the field performance data that has been collected so far uh, on the MinRoad test sections that are dedicated to this study. But I'd like to give a, a acknowledgement or a shout out to the NRA staff, the MinDOT staff, for really all your efforts and help uh, in collecting and providing this data. It's really great. Greatly appreciated. We wouldn't be able to to put together a presentation like this without um, all that uh, back effort. So thank you for that. Um, so you can go to the next slide, please. So before jumping in to look at uh, really the overlay performance, it's important to have an understanding of what the condition was of the existing pavement joints. And so shown here is the load transfer efficiency. Uh, for each test section broken down into driving and passing lane um, and highlighted in the red box are the four in situ density sections, cell 988 to 991. And you'll notice that there was relatively lower uh, load transfer efficiency in cell 990 and 991, so your regressed air void mixture and that number eight uh, mix. And then relatively higher load transfer efficiency in 988 and 989, so the 4% air void and your 5% air void design mixtures. Uh, two other test sections that we'll be kind of keeping an eye on throughout the presentation and drawing conclusions on are thinner overlay sections, 994 and 995. So again, 994 is that conventional, traditional, just single one and a half inch layer mix, um, which had higher low transfer efficiency compared to cell 995. Uh, and this will be important. We'll come back to that um, and see and kind of compare in that ultra thin, so only having three quarters of an inch of asphalt compared to almost double with an inch and a half. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that. Next slide, please. So the first set of results shown here uh, are really coming from the manual distress surveys taken at five different points uh, since construction. Uh, so we're showing the percent reflective cracking reported at joints by test section. And highlighted again in that red box, we'll keep an eye on those density sections. And in general, we've seen that uh, they've experienced less reflective cracking to date compared to some of the other test sections. Uh, and it, just as a reminder, those have four inches of total uh, pavement structure. Within that box, the regressed air void, the 3% uh, air void design mixture in cell 990, uh, and the 5% air void are kind of our, our better performers uh, among those density sections. Another test section just to keep an eye on and that has been performing well is to the left in cell 987. Um, and just as a refresher, that, that test section is also uh, comprised of four inches of um, overlay, but has varying uh, material properties and individual lift thicknesses. Next slide, please. So uh, shown here is just that same information, but in a slightly different manner orientation. So we're showing the percent cracking, but now with respect to time and service, uh, those four dashed lines are representing or highlighting those density sections. And just as an example, to illustrate this point that 
we found early on that it is really important to monitor field performance uh, both periodically but also to consider pavement structure in evaluating and comparing test sections. If you'll follow along with me with um, the dashed pink or magenta color line in cell 991, after 14 months in service, it looked to be like a very promising uh, test section and mixture performance, but after uh, 19 months in service, so five months later, we saw a dramatic increase in uh, reported reflective cracking in that test section. And so for those wondering, uh, yes, that does correspond with uh, five months of a really cold, harsh winter in, uh, in Minnesota. And so that's why we saw that kind of jump in reflective cracking during that time period. But what's nice, and again, uh, as Dr. Dalloway had kind of alluded to early on, it really uh, hats off to, to the committee and to TAP for putting together these test sections because really at the end of this and almost three, three years in, there's a nice spread in the test sections to be able to compare and say, um, you know, even among those dash lines, which mixtures are performing better um, compared to structure as well as uh, material property selection. So um, it's, been, it's been interesting to monitor, but again, the, the real takeaway here is that we really don't want to draw a conclusion at one point in time, but really to kind of look at that evolution of cracking uh, with time. Next, next slide, please. So with that in mind, um, we decided to adopt using uh, field performance indices to further uh, compare those test sections. And the idea is to try to make comparisons uh, of cracking performance over the life, but also to consider pavement structure. So I'll direct your attention uh, to the bottom left plot showing the percent reflective cracking with time and surface. And if you notice that cyan color line uh, and the teal or green color line, they end up around the same point after about 24 months in service. Um, but what is different is that evolution of cracking reported in, the, in those text sections. And so the cyan line is really outperforming that, that green or teal color line. And so the idea with the RC total index here is to really give credit to those test sections that crack later and have good early on performance. Uh, and then one way that we can consider payment structure is to then normalize that indice by uh, payment thickness. So in the plot on the bottom right, uh, we're looking now at the normalized uh, RC total by test section. And highlighted in the red, again, are those four density sections. And among them, the cell 990, which is that regressed air void mixture, is really our, our best performer, uh, and then followed by 989, which is that 5% air void uh, mixture. And then the, uh, the green box, again, is highlighting those thin overlays that we're looking to compare, uh, so cell 994 and 995. And you'll see 995 is really outperforming 994. If you remember, that has you know less than half of uh, the pavement structure there. And if you remember, the low transfer efficiency in 995 was uh, lower in both lanes too. So uh, that was kind of promising and, and interesting to see um, the, the crack resistance of, of that mixture, even with uh, such a thin pavement structure. So uh, next slide, please. So in addition uh, to kind of monitoring reflective cracking, another kind of parallel effort of this project was to, to monitor in situ density uh, and the evolution with time, with traffic and time. Um, so shown here is just as an example is the percent of air void change uh, from 2017 to 2019 uh, for the density sections, as well as um, data collected using the dynamic profiling system or DPS. Uh, the average dielectric constant change. And really so far the key takeaway from these plots is that there, there's no uh, real apparent concern about overdensification or density evolution of the uh, regressed air void or the 5% air void mixture, even that finer uh, number eight mix. Um, but again, this is two points and ideally we'll hopefully get uh, some more data this summer to be able to add to these, to these plots and to be able to draw kind of a more comprehensive uh, conclusion on these trends. But so far, um, things are things are looking good in terms of density evolution uh, for these test sections. Next slide, please. So another metric uh, that uh, was being evaluated or monitored uh, among these test sections is the International Roughness Index, or IRI. And a few things just to note about this plot. Uh, first is that all the measurements taken 
in 2017 were done prior to overlay construction. Um, and then after the overlay, you'll see a drop in a majority of those test sections in IRI uh, when that asphalt overlay is applied, um, with two exceptions. The first one being that top blue line, which corresponds to cell 983, and that is that control section. Again, so nothing was done. There's no overlay added to it, so you just see that kind of gradual increase in IRI. The second one is uh, corresponding to cell 994 in that magenta colored line. And as Dr. Dawe had uh, mentioned and walking through those test sections, that test section received uh, kind of a PCC or pre-treatment uh, done uh, in terms of using a polyurethane grout filling uh, to, slab or to stabilize those slabs under the joints and the voids. And so we saw that really there was no drop-off uh, effect in IRI even after applying that asphalt overlay and only kind of a slightly increase. And to take it a, a step further, um, as you mentioned, cell 994 and cell 984, so the lime green colored line and the magenta colored line, those two are identical, identical in terms of material and identical in terms of uh, pavement structure and thickness. The only difference was that slab stabilization was performed on that magenta uh, colored line, the 994. And so we're seeing kind of what that effect is in terms of IRI, but also, as we mentioned, uh, in terms of cracking performance and uh, other metrics. And so um, really not seeing that added benefit right now of doing that slab stabilization prior to, to overlay in terms of roughness. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to um, monitoring the field performance of our test sections, uh, we've also undertaken a substantial effort to do mechanistic analysis in terms of finite element modeling, as well as doing pavement ME simulations. And uh, the driving factor behind this and why we did it is, you know, it's great that we have 12 test sections, but it's a, a finite number, it's a limited number of uh, combinations or test sections that we're able to analyze. And so finite element modeling is, or finite element modeling is a great tool uh, to be able to simulate different pavement structures as well as different combinations of material properties uh, to try to really come up with an optimized pavement structure uh, in terms of thickness and uh, material selection. And so to date, I think we've done well over 60 different uh, model simulations through parametric evaluations in addition to uh, these 12 test sections that were modeled as built. And so shown here on the next slide, is really just a, a snapshot or a glimpse at some of the modeling results, and we're showing those uh, models as built. Um, and we simulated a historical critical low thermal event, so looking at past data, what was uh, that lowest temperature critical event that occurred, and that's really the driving factor and what was causing uh, such excessive or harsh thermal cracking potential on some of these thinner sections that you're seeing, uh, denoted by the solid red bars. And while this is kind of a conservative approach, we've uh, since then gone back and have been looking at refining that um, as well as with updated uh, thermal couple data from our actual uh, text section. So it'll be interesting to, to go back and to be able to compare those. Um, so for those test sections, uh, as I mentioned, that were um, in solid red, they were fully cracked uh, after thermal loading only. And for the ones that uh, were able to withstand the thermal cracking or the thermal loading, I should say, um, they we then applied a tire load, uh, and those are denoted by the hashed bars. And the highlighted red box, again, is showing those four in situ density sections. And with that addition of the tire load, we began to see some uh, macro cracks begin to form in the base layer materials of those test sections. And really, all of this uh, modeling effort um, is, is really going to play a, a key role in the upcoming tasks that we are currently working on. Um, and developing the overlay performance curves. And the idea here is really to try to predict pavement performance with time and to help us uh, develop that decision tree tool. And so um, the curves that we'll be developing will be using a combination of the predicted damage, as I mentioned, from the, the mechanistic analysis, but also on field performance data that we've collected for our test sections, as well as uh, early on we, we sent out surveys to the NRA members and states uh, to try to collect other test sections and information on um, overlay performance. So to really try to get a comprehensive database uh, to develop those curves. And I know we've sent out a recent survey and discussion or a survey uh, for to have with the TAP 
members um, in order to get your feedback. There's been quite a bit of interest in this, and so looking for your feedback and suggestions on how to go forward with developing those curves in terms of, uh, you know, PCI or IRI or what is the going to be the most useful thing for agencies. Um, and so we look forward to, to having that in the next uh, next couple weeks here. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Dr. Dalway to uh, wrap up the presentation. Thank you very much, Katie. And, and again, I apologize for the, the delay uh, associated with the internet and the timing. So <clears throat> as I went to next slide, it still took several seconds before I guess others were able to see it. Um, so just, just to wrap, wrap this up, we, we've already learned a, a great deal through this project, especially in context of the performances of these overlays. Uh, uh, when you look at it in terms of the materials as well as the structures. A key thing as with any field study is to have a very consistent way to come up with uh, uh, come up with, with comparisons between these sections and we feel that some of the methods that, that Katie talked about are, are really working well. Uh, they provide a fair comparison between sections. They give credit to these sections, uh, especially when they are able to defer reflective cracking. So while at three years, uh, both both sections might be at, at half of the joints reflected through, but how they got there is important. Uh, and, and so it's important to consider them. Uh, in terms of the sections, the, the biggest thing that we learned that, that uh, obviously the uh, thicker overlays do have a lower rate of reflective cracking. So that wasn't necessarily surprising. Uh, but but the, the two wear course mixture, especially the regressed air void and 5% air void, they showed really promising results. And even between those two, I would say regressed air void mixture, the one designed at 3%, uh, definitely uh, has been stellar. And, and, and the reason I say that is if you recall load transfer efficiency plot, uh, that was the section that also had one of the lowest load transfer efficiencies in existing uh, concrete. So it definitely showed, showed a tremendous uh, promise um, in, 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 in our sections. The other thing that's, that's not explicitly said on, on slide, but I would mention is uh, we have been quite impressed with, uh, with both interlayer sections, uh, the one that used the one inch highly modified interlayer with fine mixture, as well as the one that used a permeable stabilized asphalt base as an interlayer. Both of those have actually done quite well and, and, and they are thinner than these four inch overlay sections. So that, that continued use of interlays uh, do, do show promising results. And last, I will mention that the, the three quarter inch ultra thin bonded wear course, it's, it's, it's quite thin. Uh, we didn't expect it necessarily to last very long, uh, but it did hang in there and, and it did outperform some of the inch and half overlay sections, uh, especially the section that, that actually had a treatment applied to it. So, uh, there's definitely promise in, in, in that kind of approach as, as well. Uh, we have a lot to do in these coming months, uh, and part of that is also to do a lot of uh, field monitoring. Uh, obviously, that, that has been undertaken by folks at Main Road, and as I understand now that there are some, uh, uh, some relaxation of rules, they are able to get back to Main Road and do some of those efforts. Uh, others may not be possible. For example, some of the, 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 the automated survey devices require two people to operate it and so on. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we, we are expecting to, to get more data this summer to really wrap, wrap things up here. Uh, so, so what we learn, uh, main things, uh, I already talked about most of them, but, but, but the key things is in terms of structure, thicker pavements do perform better for overlays, no surprise there, but, but you could get some of those thickness advantages also by using uh, a, a smarter techniques for construction, such as bonded wear course uh, construction. Uh, and, and in terms of material, definitely that 3% air void mix seems to be outperforming pretty much everything else. Um, now, granted, it's only one cell, uh, but that one cell uh, that has PCC pretreatment actually is doing worse than its companion cell that does not have it. So, so far in this study, it's not really looking very promising for that pretreatment um, uh, to really show much, much of a promise. Uh, 
Um, and already, uh, Katie already mentioned most of the things that are ongoing, but there are a lot of other things that we are doing on this project that we did not have time today to discuss. One of them is to using lifecycle cost analysis and lifecycle assessment. We are using those tools in developing decision trees. Uh, and, and also, as, as she mentioned, we have a TAP meeting that would be coming up soon. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, all the TAP members will fill up the Doodle survey that was sent out to them. Uh, I know we had received some responses, but we're still waiting on some so that we can go ahead and, and schedule that, that meeting. Um, this slide just shows, shows once again that there's really a team effort. There's not really effort from us only. A lot of this data gathering effort happens as an RRA. Uh, and 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 we we really appreciate being part of this this association. Um, so with that, uh, if you have any questions, I know we we have uh, only a few minutes left before the end of hour. But if you have any questions, we try to answer those. Uh, and and uh, uh, as always, all your feedback is appreciated. My contact information is on the slide in case. Uh, 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 you need to contact me or don't have a chance to ask questions now. So, Lauren, I, um, um, if, I, I don't know what's the best way to handle or coordinate questions, but maybe you can, you can help us with that. Yeah, sure. We do have a few questions in the conversation box here. Um, so, I don't know if you want to yeah, just let take me, a look I'm at those right that sure. right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, will, I will start with... Uh, uh, to, 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 okay. Uh, did you account for pore water pressure on base and subgrade in your finite element simulations? Uh, question asked by Raul. Uh, Raul, no, we, we did not account for pore water pressure in our base or subgrade layers uh, in, in this analysis. Uh, we have not yet received, I know there are some moisture probes that are in these mineral cells, but we have not received that data for, uh, yet. Uh, but we we would like to look at it just to make sure that that that's not causing any kind of drastic changes. Also, keep in mind, lot of critical conditions were during winter months uh, where we expect that most of that was in frozen state. That's when we saw in field lot of reflective cracking, and also in in, in the models that's when we uh, we saw a very high potential for cracking. So. During those winter months, we, we are not expecting to have uh, a lot of pore water pressure type of uh, condition. Uh, a question from Bernard: uh, If I'm not sure if there's a scope of uh, if this is in the within the scope of this analysis, uh, but the pavement buckling prediction and evaluation, it seems that uh, at at Min Road uh, or within Min Road, they observe that. Uh, uh, they, they, the, the pavements that have asphalt overlays on concrete uh, continue to have a, a same level of probability for buckling, maybe even higher. Uh, it may have to do something with, with the thermal loading and, and, and incompressibility that forms at joint. Very, very good observation there. Uh, and, and in this study, that wasn't within the scope of project, but, but as I mentioned earlier, a nice thing is we also recently received data from Ben Worrell on, on actual temperatures within the overlay and concrete pavement here. And that's great because one thing that we will be uh, uh, looking at, uh, again, not, not primary focus of this study, but, but looking at how the temperature variation in concrete changes because of overlay. And that might provide some insight into does it change the, the buckling potential or not. Uh, uh, also, it, it might be nice, uh, maybe uh, as a follow-up or as, as, as a continuation on this project to do essentially what you described, because you do increase stress in concrete. We have seen that in our models when you put overlay, because you are restraining that concrete from moving as freely as it, as it would otherwise. But uh, no, that, that's not something that we have looked at yet. Uh, and uh, Terry had a question, did any of these sections have coal mix? Uh, no, none of these actually had cold mix dairy. Uh, that's another good approach for a CIR for, for interlayer. But keep in mind, all of these are constructed on old rigid pavement. They are not on old asphalt pavement. So to uh, do CIR may not be uh, practical uh, on these. Well, you cannot. Uh, but CCPR would have been, and, and uh, that's another approach, uh, good approach for interlayer. Uh, especially, I, I recall that there are several. Uh, 
sections or pavements that were uh, done in district 2 of MnDOT where they had done not necessarily CIR but stabilized FTR on existing pavement before overlay uh, and definitely see a significant improvement in, in terms of cracking. Uh, another question here, all, are all the reflective cracks being sealed the same way? Uh, as far as I understand, these cracks have not been sealed, so sealing has been withheld. Uh, just to, to have fair comparison between the sections. Also keep in mind, these were designed, they were under designed on purpose to make sure that we get all the reflective cracking we are going to get within three years. Um, so when you only have some of these only three quarter inch of overlay thickness, um, they were designed with, with mindset that by the end of the, the, the study, uh, the pavement will be ready for uh, for next min road study, uh, which would mean ripping off these sections and, and reconstructing them. Uh, but in this case, I, I expect that they'll probably be left behind or, or change into something else with the new configuration that's being discussed for min road. Um, so I think I covered everyone's questions, but if anyone else has any other questions, I, I definitely try to answer them. And also, as, as you can see, uh, the contact information is here. You can also go to the page for this project. We are in process of trying to put more of our task reports and things like that on there. Uh, and I believe the recording of this webinar will, will also end up on, onto the NRR website. So um, uh, feel free to contact us at, at any time as, as needed. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Well, we will uh, wrap it up now. If you, again, if you've got questions, you can feel free to email Ishan. His contact information is also on the project page. Um, and I also want to just one more time send out the link to the Pavement Workshop uh, webpage full of all of the webinar information. And uh, thank you, Ishan and Katie, for your time and um, for that detailed report. And um, thank you, everyone else, for being here. And sorry we went over a couple of minutes, but um, hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you.